Now this week we're looking at assessment and the first part of assessment is effective communication because communication or assessment is essentially a communicative process whereby students are communicating to you their understanding of their learning. But there are a range of ways that you can also facilitate communication with your students. So there's some of the things we're going to look at first. So the first of these is around the concept of active learning. So instead of students passively sitting in class and you lecturing them, you presenting a lesson to them, they're actively doing things that promote their learning. And there are a range of different techniques that we can use for that. Um, from things like group work and group discussions, um, having peers um, teaching each other. Uh, then we've got various other approaches called like the flipped classroom approach, whereby you record your presentation material and students view that at home. So instead of doing homework at home, they view your lesson presentation at home and then the time at school in class is spent doing active learning activities where they're working through projects or problems and you're assisting them with that instead of you lecturing them, you talking to them. So there are a range of different ways we can explore active learning and a range of technologies that can support that, such as um, computer games, simulations, projects, a whole range of other different approaches that also promote communication between you and the students as two-way communication, rather than just one-way communication where you are presenting information to them. So part of this relates to um, sort of a, a hierarchy of learning model, whereby we remember only a small amount of what we might read, and a little bit more about what we hear and a little bit more about what we see. So the idea of presenting information on a PowerPoint presentation and talking about it and help, helping students understand concepts is better than them just reading it in text. But then there's more complex ways of engaging with material, such as movie clips and going on excursions and looking at things um, going out into the um, forest and looking at under, understanding nature and contextualizing what they're learning. So these are all improvements upon um, previous methods of providing information to students. And then there's more active processes, such as being involved in a discussion, um, working on a task and trying to solve a task related to what they're learning. Then they might be having to present their learning um, maybe simulating it and demonstrating how it would work in real life and finally doing the real thing, actually performing what they're learning in a um, real world context. So these are sort of a hierarchy of engagement with what students are learning about in different ways. Extending upon the basic reading of information, then the teacher talking to them about information, through to more active learning processes. Okay, so the next concept is around positive reinforcement. This builds upon behaviorist theory, whereby we can encourage learning and engage students with learning through positive reinforcement of their progress. Um, students will naturally tend to learn better when they have a positive emotional response to what they're learning. Can actually learn a little bit better with negative emotional responses as well, but not as well as with positive emotional responses. But there's actually different processes in the brain that are, occur with memory retention when we are actually being praised or when we're under threat and we're having to learn essentially something to survive. So it's somewhat different and they're actually more efficient ways of forming memories than the more traditional um, short-term, long-term memory formation processes. So in terms of cognitive science, positive reinforcement does have a um, scientific basis upon why it is actually effective. So wherever possible, 
you should be trying to find opportunities to praise your students for what they're doing well and also if they're doing things inappropriately or incorrectly to admonish that. Um, but we still want to have that in a what we call a safe learning environment. If students feel under, under extreme stress and feel threatened, they can shut down and make learning much more difficult. So we don't want students under um, a high level of stress. A small amount of stress can be okay, but much more effective is if students are feeling um, positive and engaged with their learning and feeling rewarded for that process. So, some other techniques. Clear and concise instructions. Making sure that you articulate what you want students to do clearly and so that there is no miscommunication and misunderstanding. Now this will be difficult and you will be frustrated with this because students' attention is not always focused exactly on what you want it to be at all times and you may have to repeat yourself many times and engage students with um, your clear and concise instructions. But the clearer you are, the more you can um, presage, um, highlight the students that you're about to give instructions that are important for them to remember and that they engage with that process rather than thinking about whatever they're thinking about or talking to their friends and so forth, the more likely they will be able to remember and then follow the instructions that you provide them. So some techniques around that involve use of um, notes whereby you actually put up a list on the board so they don't just have to remember what you said verbally, but they can see it written down. You might use diagrams or visual aids, particularly um, icons or images and pictures that can um, grab their attention more effectively than the written word. Then there's the use of checking for their understanding. So quizzing them, asking them to repeat back what they've been told, making sure that they've actually heard and understood what you've been telling them. Just being able to repeat it is one thing. Being able to demonstrate that they understood what you meant and are going to be able to do what you intended rather than what they've interpreted you've said um, can be an important technique as well. And then finally, providing examples. Giving students a context and um, examples of how to do what you've told them to do. So they don't just have to try to understand what your instructions mean. Of course, they may be quite foreign to them. They may be very familiar to yourself, but for students who may have never have experienced or contextualized what you are actually talking about, if it's something new to their learning, then giving them some examples, particularly examples that they can relate to, can be very effective in allowing them to engage with the task that you're trying to prepare them for. Another technique is open-ended questions. Too often in classes, we ask closed questions where there is a very simple, um, often one word answer. And essentially, we know the answer. The students know we know the answer. And all we're asking them to do is to demonstrate that they know the answer that matches what you already know. So you're not really asking them a question. You're not trying to know something. The students know it's all a fiction. That you're just trying to work out whether or not they know something. But open-ended questions can engage in a true dialogue whereby you ask a question. What would happen if this happens? You may not be entirely sure yourself and you have a discussion with your students about what might occur in that circumstance. So this allows students to have agency over the conversation. It's not just them having to respond with what they know. It's actually having a discussion where you're posing a question or better yet, allowing your students to pose questions and then having a true dialogue and discussion about what the answers may be to those questions. Um, now, this, of course, will improve their creativity and their critical thinking, and it will encourage discussion. And also, it will encourage reflection, where students will think more deeply about the concepts that you're trying to engage them with, rather than just regurgitating facts that you've um, pre-prepared them 
to be able to re represent back to you. Okay, another technique we use a lot in schools is nonverbal communication, both from you as a teacher, but also from your students. Watching their nonverbal cues will give you a clearer idea about how they're engaging with what you're teaching them. Are they sitting with their heads on the desk, their eyes closed? Um, are they shaking? Are they looking out the window? These are all cues to you as to how they're engaged with and interested in what they're learning. If they're all if their eyes fixed on you, um, mouth half open, in an expectant mode, desperately interested in finding out what's going to happen next in what you're telling them, that's very different. So looking at these nonverbal cues is very important. But of course, the other aspect is that your students are watching you intently. Every movement you make, every gesture, every expression that you present on your face, conscious or unconscious, your students are going to pick up on. You need to be very aware that they will be able to determine your attitude to what you're telling them by your nonverbal cues. So while you may present in your what you say to them a balanced argument around particular issues, it will be quite clear to them which particular perspective you have a strong view on. And that's important. That's an important skill for them to learn. Um, and you need to be aware that that is occurring as you explain things to your students, particularly if it's around things that you're not particularly engaged in yourself. So if you're having to teach them something that you don't particularly find interesting or engaging, you may have to put extra effort into um, expressing yourself verbally and non-verbally in a way that engages and encourages your students to become excited and interested in the topic, even though you may not have any particular interest in it yourself. Some other techniques around non-verbal cues is maintaining eye contact with your students, um, making sure that you look at all of your students as you talk to them and you don't just focus in on a couple of students or stare at the back wall or whatever else you may um, focus on. Your facial expressions, how you actually express yourself will be an important aspect of how your students interpret what you're saying. Use of hand gestures and other um, expressive techniques. Your movement around the classroom and your engagement with your students through that movement. One of the most effective techniques in um, preventing disruptive behavior is simply to move closer to the disruptive students. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to engage with them in any other way, but simply by uh, presenting yourself in terms of making your presence known closer to them, they pick up on that either consciously or unconsciously and will adjust their behavior appropriately. So the whole process of you moving around the classroom and engaging and understanding what's occurring is sort of phrased in sort of what students frame it as the eyes in the back of your head. Your what's known as presence, your understanding of what's occurring in the classroom needs to be continuous and ongoing. And you should have a complete understanding of everything that's happening in your classroom at all times, even well before it happens. And this is something that you will build upon as you develop an experience as a teacher. Um, your students won't necessarily have that same level of skill and they won't be noticing things anywhere near to the degree you do, but certainly that's a skill you will um, pick up on and you'll be able to then manage your classroom much more effectively. Some other techniques, probing questions. A little bit like open-ended questions, but while open-ended questions are designed to promote discussion, probing questions are designed to focus in on specific things. Now, we do this quite a lot in project-based learning. Now, the idea of project-based learning is for students to have lots of choices, but we also want to guide them towards particular uh, options that we feel will help improve their learning. So by probing them with various questions, getting them to think about different things, um, have they considered using triangles for their bridge building? Have they considered um, splitting up the task so that one of their um, group members might work on one bit, another group member might work on another bit? So you're not telling them to do these things, 
but you're getting them to think about doing them through probing questions. So there's a whole range of different ways we can use probing questions, though. We can see, try to identify whether or not they have a greater understanding of what they're doing. So asking them various questions that um, elicit their deep knowledge about the concept that they're exploring. Then you can challenge their assumptions. So it may be that they're doing one particular approach and you want to see if they've considered other approaches or have considered other concepts. Um, you can encourage them to analyze and evaluate things in more detail and just promote conversation and discussions, particularly amongst um, team members through injecting probing questions into the group discussions. And also it can be used for, to provide feedback. Where you can, as you're working your way through your class and going around your groups, you can talk to your students about various things, okay? They're doing this particular thing in their tower. Have, how is it working? Is it starting to lean? And you can sort of say, okay, well, maybe you need to think about bracing this. Remember we talked about bracing in class before and how we can use triangles to make stronger shapes and, um, and getting them to think about that through the feedback you're providing on their activities. Now, part of this, though, is not just you probing your students, but it's also allowing your students to probe you through active questioning or active listening. So where you are actually listening to what your students are asking. Very often in discussions, we are thinking about what we're going to say next. And teachers are notoriously quite bad at this, um, where we're constantly thinking about what we're going to explain to students next. And we're not really listening to our students. We're not trying to hear what they're saying. We may be interested in what they're saying because it's going to help us to then explain something to them next. But that may not be the intent of the students in their talking to us. So active listening is about trying to really understand things from the student's perspective. So it's showing empathy. Why are they asking us and telling us about um, the frog they found on the weekend? Why is that important to them? Does it relate at all to the tasks? Maybe not. Maybe it's just something that they're interested in sharing. And that may be an important aspect that we still need to engage with. Of course, it's important for the student. So we shouldn't just always think that the only thing that's important in our classrooms is what we think is important. There are things that your students will consider important and the classroom is theirs as much as it is yours. Now, of course, there are certain priorities and we do need to ensure that learning occurs, but that doesn't mean we can't allow our students to have authentic voice and lead discussions around things that interest them when it's appropriate. Um, of course, this then helps encourage dialogue. If students feel that they are actually having an authentic say in the discussions that are occurring, they're more likely to engage in them. If they're simply contrived discussions that you dominate and manage, they may disengage from that because it's not particularly of interest to them. Um, it also helps you get a better understanding of your students. As they talk about things that are of interest to them, they'll go into more depth and explanation about why they're doing things, how they're doing things, and you'll be better able to help them with their learning through that better understanding from their perspective. And finally, it provides you with another opportunity to provide feedback and bring in what they're discussing and how it relates to the task and maybe help them understand when they need to focus on tasks and when they can focus on general discussions and things that interest them. But making sure you do allow time for both. Okay, some other techniques. Paraphrasing. We do a lot of explanation and um, extrapolation of different concepts in education. And one way we can help students with that is by paraphrasing the content that we provide them, providing alternative ways of understanding the material that we're presenting them. And the more different approaches we can provide that, the more likely the students are to be able to understand the concepts and engage with them. So ideally, you should be able to paraphrase in different ways and from different approaches. But it helps encourage active listening 
course, students are then having to interpret your new meaning about the concepts. It also helps them sometimes understand concepts better by hearing about them from different perspectives. It'll reinforce key concepts, encourage deeper understanding, and again, provide opportunities for feedback as students express their understanding and feedback to you as a teacher, but also in you providing feedback to them about how they've understood the concepts. So one technique is actually to get your students to paraphrase the content, um, to summarize and explain it back to you so that you can then understand how students are engaging with the concept being explored. And this helps with their development of their critical thinking. So one approach used in this course is the fairy tales, where it provides an alternative method of engaging with the content so that you can explore things in a slightly different way and think about things from a different perspective rather than the more traditional perspective in terms of content presentation. Okay, and finally, there's a concept called metacommunication. This is students' understanding about communication. And also you, as a teacher, your understanding of the importance and processes of communication, the things that we've been talking about just at the moment. So the better you can understand processes of communication, the better you can engage your students, but also the more your students understand the processes of communication and how you help develop that as a skill in them, the better they are going to be able to incorporate communication processes in their group work with their peers, in their communication to you as a teacher, but also in their communication through their various tasks where they may need to do a presentation or an explanation and a whole range of other pro uh, processes whereby they need to be effective communicators. So you should always be looking for ways of developing students' skills as communicators. In addition, of course, to the development of your own skills as an effective communicator and teacher.